When I was a student, I wangled a free game of tennis and I thought, oh, brilliant, this will be great. And I was really looking forward to it. But then, you know, something, I can't remember what now, but something turned up and I couldn't go. And it's been, oh, it's been really bothering me ever since. But now, finally, I've got my day here at the tennis court in Jesmond Dean in Newcastle. Uh, but this is what some people would call a real tennis court. But I'm not going to call this real tennis because this is tennis. This is, this is proper tennis. This is the original tennis, not its replacement, not the, the upstart lawn tennis, you know, the one they play at Wimbledon. That's only been around for a very short while, really. The first uh, tennis club, lawn tennis, uh, was formed in 1872 in Leamington Spa. No, 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 no. This, this sport of kings, this goes right back to the medieval period and was very popular throughout the Renaissance. This is proper tennis. Now, there are only about 50 courts like this in the world now, and over half of them are in England. Uh, there are a few in the USA, and there are only three now in France, and one of those was built last year. Um, and that's a big change because once this game was big, really big. For instance, in Paris alone, we know that there were at least 250 courts between about 1500 and 1750. But the population of Paris was only 300,000 back in those days. Today, uh, Paris has 2.2 million people living in it, and there are actually fewer courts. There are only about 199 tennis courts there now. So in terms of tennis courts per 1,000 people, there were over nine times as many tennis courts in uh, Paris back in the day than there are today. So yeah, this was really big. It was popular uh, with audiences, it was popular with gamblers as well, and with kings. Now, admittedly, there are a few other sports like horse racing that are also called the sport of kings, but um, it's definitely the case that an awful lot of kings play, uh, played this sport. And uh, today it's still associated with royalty in that Prince Edward is, uh, is a big fan of this and has played in every court in the UK. Now, you can imagine that the idea of bouncing a ball off a wall uh, is not actually that unusual. It's not that tricky to come up with. So lots of people came up with the idea, and locally they would come up with their own game. So if you had some building with a nice tall, flat wall, uh, which would often, of course, back in the day have been uh, an ecclesiastical building, like a monastery or something, uh, then the local kids could just whack something, a ball of some sort. Um, uh, in the early days, monks used to... Uh, so we are told, uh, take shreds of their robes and, and tie them up into a ball, and there you go. You've got something that hit that'll bounce a little bit off a wall, a little bit approximate, but it'll do. It's easy to imagine, isn't it? There you are, a bored chorister uh, at a, a cathedral, and you notice that uh, there are some interesting angles to bounce a ball off, and you've got something that you can hit with your hands, so you do, and you, you whack it up there, and it comes down here, and you just play with and some of your friends then come along, and, and then you start coming up with rules, and you make a game of it. It doesn't really take a genius to see that uh, it, this is going to happen many times. This is a sport that could be uh, independently invented by lots of cultures over and over. But after a while, it became more codified. And uh, whereas the jeu de palm, the literally game of palm, handball, if you like, uh, evolved in one direction into Eton Fives, uh, which is still played today with just a glove and you, you whack a ball about the size of a golf ball that's made out of very hard cork. Um, it also evolved in another direction towards tennis. And of course, one of the things that uh, makes it tennis is you introduce the racket. The early ones looked like ping pong bats. They had very, very short handles. Uh, but then later they, they got a little bit more elaborate, longer handles and a springy surface. And uh, in the early days, sometimes that was just a sheet of vellum which was stitched into a frame rather than strings that we're familiar with today. And I, I read an interesting uh, story about a scholar who was playing at uh, some ecclesiastical uh, place where someone had clearly pilfered a bit of vellum uh, from uh, the library and then stitched it into the frame to make his racket. And he was looking at his, his hired racket and he saw with some alarm that there's, there's writing here and it's just about decipherable and uh, reported that he, it was from a lost decade of Livy. Uh, Livy, you know, the Roman author. Oh, I should explain decade. Decade is a, a group of 10 books. Anyway, ah, that could have been quite, that could have been quite, could have quite vital. Uh, but anyway, sport the thing. Every part of a tennis court has a name, it seems, and I'm new to some of these, so bear with me, I'll struggle to remember them, but here we go. Uh, so at the end here, we have the dedans. That's that uh, netting there. And if you can hit a ball into the dedans, you can score a point. And these are the galleries. Uh, this is where the audience will be watching the show, and each of these has its own name. So this is uh, the third, and this is the second. No, it isn't. This is the last. 
and this is the second, and this is the door, because once uh, there was actually a door here, and you can see the distance between these two posts is about the width of a door. Um, this is the first, and then we have the line, which is next to the line, the net, which uh, has a thick padded top to it, I just uh, have discovered. Uh, and this hangs slackly like a clothes line, and one uh, possible origin of it is that they started with a clothes line. It seems that uh, in the early days there was just a line and that the net got added later. Then round on the other side uh, we have the hazards. Um, so we have uh, hazard the line, hazard the first, hazard the door, Hazard the second, and this one's different because this one has a bell. And if you can get the ball in here, you can win a point. So this is the winning gallery. And uh, also at this end, uh, because the court is asymmetrical, it's not just asymmetrical uh, from the, the, the gallery side and this, to this flat wall, it's also asymmetrical end to end. And this end, and not that end, has a timbre, which is this bit. Uh, not every court has a timbre, and the timbres aren't exactly the same uh, angle in every, every court. Every court has got its own individual quirks, uh, but that's the timbre. And this sloping roof here is called the penthouse, and uh, that's definitely in play. So a lot of the, the, uh, the shots will involve bouncing and rolling the ball along the penthouse roof. I'm off the court now in the gallery, so this is where the audience would watch the action, and they would bet Sometimes they would bet a lot. Indeed, the grand old Duke of York, uh, you know, uh, son of George III, uh, allegedly had 10,000 men and marched them up and down hills. That's the fella. Uh, he, it seems, racked up a debt of 60,000 pounds betting on this game. And, and that was back in those days, which 60,000 pounds is a staggering sum. I mean, in today's money, it's this much. I know. And, and it was in the gallery that Anne Boleyn, you know, the second of Henry VIII's uh, wife collection, uh, was informed that she was for the chop. Um, and history does record that what particularly irked her was that uh, they whisked her away, not giving her time to collect her winnings. Oh, come on, Anne, priorities. Now, lawn tennis used to be played with these. This is an old-fashioned lawn tennis racket. And this is one of the, the new-fangled ones with a slightly bigger head and bigger sweet spot. And to give you some idea of the contrast, this is the racket they use for proper tennis. And one thing you'll notice is that it's smaller. Another is that it's asymmetrical. The reason for this is that the ball doesn't bounce so high, and so a lot of the time you're swinging very low to the ground and reaching for it, so you want to be able to sweep along, and that is supposedly why they have this asymmetrical shape. Sometimes you're close to a wall as well, and the same thing applies. The sound they make when pinged uh, is quite distinctive. So here, you hear that sound, whereas here, you can see it's a much higher pitched sound. That's not just because the strings are shorter, they are also tensioned much, much more uh, because they're whacking a harder ball. Now the balls are very similar in size uh, to the modern lawn tennis ball. So here's a lawn tennis ball and here's uh, a proper tennis ball. Uh, so you can see about the same size and today the same color for the same reasons, though of course traditionally these were white. Um, but this is heavier, it's a lot harder, you wouldn't particularly want to be hit by this at high speed, and a lot less bouncy. So let's just see how much less bouncy, shall we? That much less bouncy. And these are also handmade, which makes them a little bit more, shall we say, approximate. Each one is unique in its particular quirks. They, um, are not perfectly spherical, and these seams uh, stick out a little bit more here and there, uh, which means that the bounce can be rather unpredictable. Now, because these are heavier and harder, um, they don't swerve when you spin them in the air very much, uh, but when they hit a wall and get a decent grip, uh, the spin can send them zinging off along the wall uh, to great effect. The game was played not just in France and Britain, but elsewhere too. It was uh, played in Spain, it was quite popular in Italy, it was played in the Netherlands, in the Habsburg Empire, and there is, I'm told, some evidence that it was played in Germany. In France, though, it fell out of favour quite definitely after the French Revolution because it was associated with the, the hated aristocracy. 
um, uh, we can uh, say that two, two French kings were killed by this game. Uh, Louis X of uh, France uh, played the game, got rather sweaty, uh, caught a chill, died. Uh, and Charles VIII managed to whack his head on a door lintel whilst walking onto the court so badly that uh, that killed him as well. A famous meeting in France that kicked off the French Revolution uh, was where they held the tennis court oath. And it was in a large room like this that they had that very crowded and raucous meeting. Uh, the big ideas were being swapped and you could imagine it could have turned violent or very nasty and all sorts of people might have tried to come along and stop them. Uh, and even though this is a very big space, there is one really big drawback that strikes me in that there's no way out here, there is no door here. If just a single soldier with a halberd or something had stood there and blocked the door. What could anyone have done? And can you imagine if there'd been a panic and everyone tried to leave and they're trying to get through this one tiny door? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have picked this venue. The game gets referenced in lots of works of art, and perhaps my favorite reference to it is in uh, Act One, Scene Two of Shakespeare's Henry V. Um, now, just to set the scene, uh, Henry, the young king of England, has just been counselled by two high-ranking clerics, and they have both told him that he is definitely, definitely the legitimate heir to the throne of France. So he thinks, OK, my cause is good, my cause is just. And uh, then he sends for the French ambassador. And he's a bit miffed, actually, uh, that he didn't get the ambassador from the king himself, but instead from the Dauphin, the king's son. Uh, but, well, he'll have to do. And so uh, the Dauphin comes in, and their niceties are exchanged, and the Dauphin says, uh, I've brought you a, a ton of treasure, a ton as in a, a container of treasure. And uh, uh, Henry thinks, uh, oh, yeah, right. And uh, he, he says to his uncle, who's uh, standing next to the treasure, which is still, at the moment, sealed inside its container, what treasure, uncle? Tennis balls, my liege. We are glad the Dauphin is so pleasant with us. For his present and your pains, we thank you. When we have matched our rackets to these balls, then in France we shall play a set, shall strike his father's crown into the hazard. Tell him he hath made a match with such a wrangler that all the courts of France will be disturbed with chases. And we understand him well uh, when he comes over us with my wilder days, not measuring the use we put them to. Tell the pleasant prince that his mock hath turned his balls to gunstones, and his soul shall stand sorely charged for the wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. For many a thousand widow shall this mock, mock out their husbands, mothers mock from their sons, mock castles down, and some are as yet ungotten and unborn who will have cause to curse the Dauphin's scorn. So, get you hence, in peace, and tell him this, his jest shall savour but shallow wit, when thousands weep more than did laugh at it. Which just goes to show that you shouldn't really mock British royalty with uh, uh, tennis analogies because they don't like you for it. Uh, so then he goes over to France, captures Harfleur, then goes to a place called Agincourt and kills half the French nobility in a day. So, uh, yeah. Okay, mock that up. 
I can play this reasonably well when I'm sitting down. But, you know, because it's, I, I'd stand up, you see, and it's got a shiny back and it just skids all over the shop here. I can't, I'm trying to hold it high so you can see it because but playing it down here, you know, I, I could just be miming and you, anyway, that was the, um, uh, that was the, the, uh, the introductory jingle for the sponsor time. And the sponsor is Audible. And just in case you don't know what Audible is, well, it is the world's biggest purveyor of English language audio content. So there. And if you go to audible.com stroke Lindy Beige or text Lindy Beige to 500 500, then you can take advantage of a free 30 day old trial offer they've got. And during that trial period, you can download one thing, whatever it is, of your choice from there. And you get to keep it forever. You don't have to listen to it during uh, the 30 day trial. No, no, no. You can download it to your hard drive. It's yours. Um, uh, you could, of course, uh, peruse all the various Audible originals. These are Audible originals. And these are called that because they were originated by Audible. They stumped up the cash and got these things made and they're only available um, on the Audible website. Uh, but there are other things too. And um, if you were to type in, for instance, Shakespeare, as you might be inspired to do uh, uh, for the obvious reasons, um, and you may find that if you do type in Shakespeare, then there are, yes, inevitably vast numbers of hits, all sorts of plays and books about him. But for just the sheer length of the thing, they're all 99 hours of it, you might want to consider getting the complete works of Shakespeare that they have with, with star names like, like Ian McKellen and Derek Jacobi, or Jacoby as they call them in America, uh, Diana Rigg, Prunella Scales, Timothy West. I can't help feeling, though, that when these were originally released, they were, were recorded in the 1950s and 60s, that those wouldn't have been the big star names that would have been headlining the, the, the adverts. No, uh, I think they would have probably put John Gielgud, Michael Horden, Peggy Ashcroft uh, back in, in those days. But there you go. New generations have risen and fallen. That's the general state of things as there are, uh, as they are. So um, there you go. You could listen to Shakespeare for 99 hours. What a bargain and all for free. Why don't you do that? Right, well, I'm very lucky because I'm joined here by Zach Edel, who's a professional in this sport and not just a professional, a champion too. Do you know he won the under 24s when he was just 21? Yeah. Anyway, um, you're going to show me uh, what to do and explain chases because they really confuse me. Yes, chases is the uh, slightly complicated part of the game, but hopefully we can uh, try and get you competent enough to play a game, at least. Good. Right, how do I start? Exercise one, you roll the ball, I whack it over there, yes? Correct. I'm not okay. going to give you any coaching techniques, any... Tips. No clues. I'm just going to let you see what, what comes out. Okay. okay. Are you ready? My first go at hitting the ball. Very nearly hit the GoPro. I'd mastered it! So, this is the serving end. You always serve from here. Right. The ball will be placed in the dead on. Mm -hmm. So, for convenience, so usually you empty the balls there and you don't have to worry about picking them up all the time, which is really nice. Right. Uh, all the white lines on the court are essentially white because they're to do with the serving. Okay. Okay, so the white line you see in front of us here, mm -hmm. which also doubles up as a second gallery line, that's where you must serve behind. Okay, so I can serve from anywhere in this square. Exactly. So you can right. serve anywhere behind that white line. Now, because of that, you can obviously probably work out there's a lot of variations of serve mm -hmm. because of the vast distance that you can a go. A lot of angles, yeah. Yeah, so I think there's something, hundreds, hundreds of different serves you can do, and they've all got funny names. Uh, the giraffe, boomerang, railroad. Uh, so I'm going to teach you a very basic second serve. Okay, it's called the bobble. Okay. So this is essentially what you would do if you have a first bolt, okay? So just oh, do so you get two serves as in lawn tennis? Yes, yeah, you get two serves as in lawn tennis. I'll hit one very basically for you, mm -hmm. and I want you to try and copy. So a bobble serve up onto the roof, and ideally you're looking to land it in the crack of the back wall. Very awkward to return. If you land it in there, the ball will essentially just die. Yeah. Okay, very yeah. hard to do, but if you're going to get it right, it's... it's Brilliant. Right, so if okay. you're at that end and you see it's likely to do that, you, 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 you get you, it on the volley before volley it lands. In. Exactly, yeah. Good. Okay. okay, so you have a go. Right. I don't think I'm going to bother with the backspin thing that no, you no, did. No, this, yeah. isn't, this isn't backspin, this is just literally a flat hit. Very, very right. flat. Right, so it was. Yeah, good. So that one's slightly too hard. Too hard. To the back roof, which then makes it easier for your opponent to return. Yep. Okay. So a bit softer. Good. Still too hard. Even too much. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually very soft, sir. It, isn't it is. It's extremely soft. There you go. Perfect. Nice. Wow. So that 
that's a lot more difficult to your, for your opponent to return rather than hitting it long onto the roof. Yeah. So go a bit closer into the wall. That's it. And then hit down into the penthouse above the last gallery. Here? Yeah. Ah, that one was actually, that was legit. It was, it was legit. You were good. So that was it. <laughs> right. Okay, so that's your first serve. Okay. And then you've got your bobble as your second serve. So it's not like lawn tennis where you can essentially ace somebody. It's very rare in this game that you can very, that you can ace somebody on the serve. Right. Which is a nice thing because lawn tennis is very dominated by the serve, whereas this isn't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we span a racket to determine who would get choice of end. I lost and Zach chose to serve. Yes. Here we go then. My first go at a game of tennis. And with my first untidy strike, I set a chase at five. Ah, I'm going to have to try to explain that. Explaining chases is a bit like trying to explain the offside rule in football. You think you understand it until you voice it and then you're not so sure. Chases are a major part of the game though and I'd be doing you a disservice were I not at least to try. So, here follows an unofficial and incomplete explanation of chases. A chase is set when a ball bounces for a second time on the floor at one end of the court. It can bounce any number of times off the walls and penthouses and still be in play. The player at the hazard end of the court is at a big disadvantage because if the second bounce occurs in this area of the court, then the server wins the rally. This largely explains why players stay quite close to the back wall here. There is very little rushing the net in this game because the walls make it so easy for a player to bounce the ball around and to behind a net rusher. I win! Don't! If the ball bounces for a second time elsewhere at one end of the court, such as here, then a chase is set. Neither player scores a point. Instead, players make a mental note of which painted line measured the spot, and when two chases have been set, the players swap ends and then the chases are resolved for points. This is how a player languishing at the hazard end gets to serve, so it is vital for him to set chases. Right. When playing a chase, all the usual ways to win, such as hitting the dedans, the ball is a lot faster than a lawn tennis ball, or winning gallery, hey! Uh, still apply. But another way to win is for the player who set the chase to let the ball bounce for a second time on the floor at his end of the court, when that bounce is closer to the net than the length of the chase. I win! In other words, the other player trying to beat the chase wins by double bounce only when that second bounce is closer to the back wall than the length of the chase. Got it? You have? Could you explain it to me? Now, there is a notion which I'm going to introduce you to, um, which is just a notion, you understand, which explains the bizarre scoring system of tennis. Uh, and I love this idea because it's just so neat and it explains so much. Unfortunately, the evidence for it is extremely scanty and there is a bit of a problem uh, with it, which I'll explain in a moment. But anyway, the idea is that originally the game was scored on a clock. So someone said, oh, well, there's this old clock here. Let, let's use that to keep the score. And so when you score the point, he would move the hand through 90 degrees like that. And so the first point is called 15. Why is it called 15? Well, because you've spanned through 15 minutes on the clock. And uh, you win another point, well done. So the next point is 30. And the idea is to get from the noon position, which I think you'll agree is a very neat starting point, once all the way around the clock. And if you can do that, you've won the game. And that's, that's wonderfully satisfying, isn't it? There's something very, very complete and whole about one full circle. So 15, 30, up. But why don't you go to 45? Well, they still had the advantage uh, system. So if you went to 40 and then someone else got to 40 as well, so it's deuce, then you've still got two equal sweeps of 10 minutes advantage game to get there. So it'd be much clearer. And 40 is also quicker to say than 45. So you'd go to 40 next and then uh, possibly advantage and then well done, game. And then uh, the next game, you, you, you win that again, well done you. And the next time you get to maybe 30, but then oh, the other guy plays play brilliantly well and uh, he then wins the game. So you wind it back uh, because you didn't win that one. But every time you win, you go back to the top. Now, how many games have I won now? Well, uh, three. You can tell I've won three games because the hour hand has been keeping track automatically and in a way that's extremely difficult to fudge or cheat or forget accidentally. It's been keeping track of the number of games you've won. Every time you win a game, the hour hand records it automatically. And if you can get halfway round, you've now won the first set. 
And you think you'll agree that that straight line position uh, is another very satisfying position to get to. And if you can get all the way, whoops, all the way um, up to the top, then you've won the game in, admittedly, a three-set match. So that is how maybe the scoring system of tennis uh, evolved. Um, and if you wanted to play a five-set match, you'd just have to start with the hour hand pointing at the bottom. One of the big problems with this, however, uh, is that the evidence, as I say, is very uh, scanty, but also in the early days of tennis, uh, which is when the scoring system was established, clocks didn't have a minute hand, uh, which ruins it, doesn't it, really? Um, I mean, it, it wouldn't be useless as a scoring method. You could still use the hour hand uh, to get to the bottom, keeping track of games, but to do, do the points within the game as well requires the, the minute hand. But anyway, there you go, it's a notion. It was in 1760 that the world's first world championship of this sport took place and that championship is still going and so it's the world's longest running world championship. Yes, this is a well-established sport, but it did fall out of favour and it's not played in Spain, Italy and those other places that used to play it. Uh, and its popularity today uh, it stems almost entirely from a revival that happened in Victorian England. Um, and of course that's when this court was built here. This building was built in 1894 at the expense of a local very wealthy arms manufacturer called Andrew Noble, later Sir Andrew Noble. Uh, he was 63 years old, he'd just been knighted and he thought, I want something to attract really high-class guests uh, uh, to my house. So his grand house, which was over there, had a view this way of this side, which is the nicer side uh, of this rather magnificent, I think you'll agree, building. So this is the outside of the, uh, the tennis court and uh, he succeeded in uh, attracting some very high-class guests. In fact, uh, when this f place uh, was first officially opened, they had an exhibition match uh, with a chap called Earl Grey, uh, not the Earl Grey of the Earl Grey Monument in the centre of Newcastle. Uh, this was a, a later Earl Grey who became uh, Foreign Secretary during World War I, so he's a still pretty uh, well-connected guy. And uh, he was um, criticised for having wasted his time at Oxford by playing too much tennis. Uh, but anyway, it's good, isn't it? Looks good at night, too. Now, you may wonder what this is. You see, we've got a couple of steps here, and then we've got a ramp. Well, I can tell you, this is mysterious. Joseph Bickley, uh, born in 1835, uh, he built this court, and he patented a special plaster mix that was meant to be particularly good against damp and mould and the like. And uh, I don't know if he would have approved of his court being used for something else. You can see lots and lots of closely spaced beam holes here uh, for big timbers and they supported once the weight of a mezzanine floor because during World War II this useful space was uh, put to use making barrage balloons uh, so you can imagine them laying out huge pieces of cloth on this enormous floor and then on the mezzanine up there they stored the finished things. There's a big crack in the wall there you'll see uh, apparently it was 1943 when a bomb landed a little bit close for comfort and did that Mary, Queen of Scots, loved to play this game and apparently scandalised some by wearing breeches like a man. Other kings were also very keen. Henry VIII, famously, uh, played at Hampton Court, although the court that was built at Hampton Court was originally built for Cardinal Wolseley, showing its ecclesiastic uh, roots there. Uh, but it was the Charleses who particularly loved to play there. King Charles I, of course, uh, played tennis quite a lot until they cut his head off, uh, but then his son, uh, King Charles the second, uh, he was mad keen on it. And Samuel Pepys uh, records that a lot of people were loathsomely sycophantic about how wonderful His Majesty's playing was. Um, he was so keen, in fact, that he used to get up really early in the morning so he'd get a few games in early. And he even had a bed uh, in a room at the tennis court so that he could spring straight into action. Uh, and he was curious to know how much weight he lost through presumably sweating a lot uh, during the games. And so he had a, a steel yard uh, installed and uh, according to one game that uh, Samuel Pepys records in his diary, His Majesty lost four and a half pounds. The game was something like its modern self in the 13th century, which is when we first get uh, fully enclosed, purpose-built tennis courts. But it's not until 1592 that we have published rules for it. At least these are the ones that we can look at today. People really did get into this game. Samuel Pepys records in his diary that he heard of a Quaker actually swearing when he lost. Quakers aren't supposed to swear. 
Pictures from back in the day show the game being played by teams of three, four, five, even six players aside. Then they could afford to have a player near the net. I have to say, I'd, I'd love to give that a go. Right, now, so I'm about to start my third game, and if you remember, I was serving at the end of the second game, and here we are at the beginning of the next, but I'm still serving. Uh, serve actually changes during a game rather than between games, as in lawn tennis. Okay, right, uh, so I need to be standing about, well, here was it for the Dudari one? Always given me a very gentle, easy one. Here it bounces off the timbre. You can see this is not an easy sport to televise. But why is the first stroke of a rally called a serve? Well, it's because in the early days of tennis, you would be served it by a servant. So, Some sources say he threw the ball into play, others that he hit it with a racket. Either way, he got the ball moving and then got out of the way to let win. his masters carry on from there. So you should have left it? Yeah. Ah, OK. That was a mistake on my part. I probably should have left, left it for a hazard chase. Right. So Okay, scored a point. Well played, <laughs> Oh, too hard. Oh, way too hard. Oh, I got lucky though. Did you see the side of the dodgy mouse? It was a bit dodgy, yeah, in my favour. Get in. Back in the day, there was a guild of professional tennis players which protected its members from pernicious purveyors of unauthorised tennis balls. And these guildsmen had to be not just good at playing the game, but also had to be able to make and supply equipment for it. Here we see that this tradition is alive as a racket is restrung at the court. Practice fingers weave the string in and out, then heave it into the required tension, whereupon an awl is used to hold the string in place. The core of the ball is a mass of chopped up loose bits of wine cork, contributed by the convivial players, encased in an old ball cover, which is wound about with string, then wrapped in a few layers of cloth ribbon, then round about again with string in a particular pattern, beaten into a sphere with a hammer in a concave former, then the outer cover's two parts are cut into shape by eye, and held in place you'll notice with nails, then hand sewn together before being given another going over with the hammer. That's the same thing. I, that would have been fine with a symmetrical tennis racket, but not with this. You are about to witness my deliberately leaving a ball to bounce twice. I didn't do this very often because familiarity with other racket games urged me to return every ball, but a few times I got it right. Okay. Not, okay, so I did do the right thing at least. Okay, so that bounced about here. Right, so that's a big part of this game is choosing when not to continue a rally. So why is it called tennis, I imagine you're wondering? Uh, well, nobody really knows. It's lost in the mists of time. It's just too old a game. But there is this idea that there might have been an Anglo-Norman form of the word tene, tenets, uh, which would be the imperative form of take. So someone perhaps just before serving might say tenets, as in take this. Ah, oh, too hard again. Mm. Come on! Yes! I was actually trying to do that. So is it now 40-15? Good grief, I might actually win a game. Oh, not like that though. Oh, I forgot to say that there's another instant point-scoring target on the back wall of the hazard end yes. on the Tamba side. It's called the grill, and I managed to hit it a few times. Again, I was actually trying for that, but I think you could have got that. I think you, you let that go in. To... Game point, you now swap. Okay, I'll give okay. you that. Thank you. I've won a game! I won at least two games, but he was not playing his hardest oh. and didn't aim much for the dreaded Tamba of doom. Oh. 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 <laughs> oh. Oh, I'm going to leave it. Yes! Yeah, I can do this. Okay. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, for... Oh! Oh. <laughs> okay. So score is? Oh, uh... 30 Oh, right, is it? Okay. Yeah, 30 Dead on! You clearly left it. No, it was too high, it was a good shot. If you've had enough, ha! No, no, I mean, the thing is that it, it, I was having a really good time, genuinely. Uh, it, it's fun. I could play, I could play this lots more. Uh, you'll notice, uh, by the way, that all that time uh, he was playing at a disadvantage because he's got a smaller racket. In the evening, I watched a match between Zach and the current world number 17. Longer rallies, more shot variety, not as much beige, but the fine added feature of a raucous crowd.